All right. So are similar. Let's find out what it's all about. So click this one. Okay. What is it asking us? Two arrays are called similar if one can be obtained from another by swapping at most one pair of elements in one of the arrays. Given two arrays of and B, check whether they are similar. Okay. So this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, we want to check if these arrays are similar, and we're, we're being given a definition for what that means. So basically we're saying they're similar uh, if if we can swap at most one pair of elements. So like basically, okay, take A, compare it to B, those are the same, so yeah, it's true. In this one, take A, compare it to B, and what we see is that if we were to switch these first two elements here, so if we were to swap the one and the two here, just replace them with each other, we'd have two, then one, and then three, and that's what this one is over here. So we would return true, true, uh, because we can obtain B by swapping one pair of elements in A. Okay, and then we take a look at this one, one, two, 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 one, one. Well, that one's a definite no, because it just, it doesn't contain the same elements. You know, like this one has two twos and a one, this one has two ones and a two. So that one's definitely going to be false. But, you know, there, there could be other examples here, right? Like we could say maybe A is uh, one, two, three, four, and then B is something like two, one, four. Or three. So could we obtain B by swapping at most one pair of elements in A? I would argue no, because we're basically exchanging the one and the two here. That's one swap already. We would have to do another swap to get these in the right place. So we really should be getting a false for this one. Uh, and I think we will. So now we need to build a function that, that does that. So how are we going to do that? Well, as you guys probably know by now, I usually like to start by sort of taking on the most naive interpretation of the problem. So if it's saying check if B can be obtained by swapping one pair of elements in A, why don't we just go ahead and try swapping every possible pair of elements in A, and then if we get B, then great, you know, we're done. So before we do that, let's just check, you know, is A equal to B? Are they the same right off the bat? So, because like for this first one, which, yeah, test number one, they're the same. So that one should be true. So let's return A equals equals B right off the bat, and we'll see if that's true. Wait a second, it's telling us that's false? A is not the same as B? How could that be false? Okay, well... I'm pretty sure this has to do with pointers, that kind of thing. Like, for example, if I were to say let C be assigned the value of A and then return A is equal to C, that would be true because now A and C are pointing to the exact same thing in memory. Whereas A and B in this case happen to have the same elements in them, but they're not pointing to the same array in memory. So this has to do with that whole deep copying thing we've talked about before. It's kind of like uh, when we do this, C is assigned the value of A. If I make a change to C here, I'm making a change to A. Okay, so if I mutate C, I'm mutating A. So because of that, um, basically that's how it's going to compare arrays. If it's trying to check if arrays are equal, it's actually comparing the pointers or like the addresses that these variables are pointing to, not the actual contents of the array. So that means if I want to actually compare the contents of the arrays, I would have to do something like this. Uh, make a compare function and it's going to take array 1 and array 2 and the way it would work is basically it'll run through the elements here, so it will say let i is on the value 0, i is less than array 1, not like 5 plus plus, and if array 1 at i is not equal to array 2 at i, then that means, well, they must not be the same thing, so we're going to return false. And if it makes it all the way to the end of that loop without uh, having an issue, without having uh, a return false here, then it's going to return true. 
Now technically there could be a bit of an oversight in this compare function because uh, if it so happens that A and B are the same, like if A was 1, 2, 3 and then B was 1, 2, 3, 4, let's say, like if it was a different length, then that would be a problem and it's something I would have to build into my compare function here. But notice in the guaranteed constraints it actually says that B is the same length as A. So because of that, I'm not going to bother doing any checks because it would be redundant. I mean, we already know that they're going to be the same length. So no sense in building in a test for something that we know is not going to be the case. Let's compare A and B. Okay, so now we see in the first case, they are the same array. In the second case, they're not the same array. These ones, uh, false, false. Okay, I was a little worried by the check mark there, but yeah, it's because they're meant to be false. Okay, so really I think it was just this first one where they happen to be the same array and therefore we should return true. So we'll use this compare function. I mean another way we could do it is we could just say something like a.join and then maybe put a little comma in there uh, is equal to b.join because now we're comparing strings. We're taking the arrays, we're converting them to strings and if they have the same elements then the strings will come out the same. So yeah, that's true as well. Okay, so uh, which way is better? I don't know. We'll use the compare function for now. We've got it written. I don't know which one's faster, but I would imagine probably the compare function because we're not worried about like uh, converting to strings and stuff like that. I mean, uh, I consider that string method a bit noisy in the sense that like we don't have any intention of using those strings so converting them to strings is actually kind of abusing the, the, the notation you know we're abusing the tool we're not using it for the right job you know it's kind of like using a hammer to drive in a screw it's it's just not the right tool it might get the job done but it's not designed for that and so we might feel a little gross doing it that way. So, okay. Um, but, you know, there are different philosophies out there. Some people will tell you whatever gets the job done. The point is, I'm going to use this compare function for now. So, okay. We basically want to generate all the possible possibilities for arrays that are like, you know, one, one swap of... Uh, of, of array A and we'll see if it ends up being B. Okay, so which elements do we want to switch? Well, let's make some for loops for that. For let i be assigned the value of 0, i is less than a dot length minus 1. Why minus 1? Well, because we're going to be comparing that to j, which is going to represent the uh, other element, the other index that we're comparing to. These are the ones we're going to swap. So we're going to swap the element at index i with the element at index j. No sense, in, no sense in ever looking back, right? So we'll go through these arrays and we'll say, okay, we'll swap this one with this one. Then we'll swap this one with this one. Then we'll swap this one with this one. And at that point, that's all we can do. Uh, but like what I'm trying to say is i is going to be this, then it's going to be this. But it, it's never going to be 3 because there's nothing after 3. And i is only comparing to elements after it itself, right? So 1 gets compared to 2 and 3. 2 gets compared to 3. At that point, there's nothing else left to do. If it was a longer array, we have more stuff to do. But uh, for this case, we don't. So that's why we stop at minus 1. But for this one, we're going to go all the way. And actually, you know what? I see now that I'm using a.length twice. So... We want to keep this dry, right? Dry, don't repeat yourself. Uh, oh, thanks, ATD. You caught it before I did. Uh, so we're going to say let length be assigned the value of a dot length. Okay, great. And then length minus 1. Yeah, so we're trying to make this dry. We want to don't repeat yourself. We want to not repeat ourselves, is what I'm trying to say. So dry stands for don't repeat yourself. It's kind of a mantra for a lot of programmers. If I'm calling a dot length twice, well, don't call a dot length twice. Uh, no sense in doing that. Store it in a variable if you're going to use the value more than once. Okay, so nice. This is looking good. And then basically I'll actually do the swap. And this is actually going to be kind of cool. So we've seen this before. Uh, I I think it was yesterday we swapped two elements in an array. Uh, it might have been before. But first, let's just say copy is going to be a dot slice. So that's basically just making a deep copy of array A. The reason I'm making a deep copy is because I'm going to 
be switching some elements around. So when I do that, I don't want it to actually modify A. I want it to just make this new copy that's that's a bit different. Okay, so, and, and by the way, there are other ways we could do this that uh, that would be probably better, to be honest, like more memory efficient, but we won't worry about that for now. AHA is temp. Okay, and then basically at that point, let's just say con console.log copy. And let's just run that. Let's see what we get from this. So if we take stock of what we're doing, we're saying copy is just a new copy of A. And then why are we doing this temp? Well, it's because we want to assign the value of A at J to A at I, and we want to assign the value of A at I to A at J. But we're already assign reassigning A at I, so if we were to just put A at I here, it would just be whatever A at J already was. It's not really giving us anything new, so that's why we had to do temp over here. Okay, so then 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2. This is basically all the possibilities we could get by swapping one pair of elements. So uh, if we swap the first two, we get 2, 1, 3. If we swap the first and last, we should get 3, 2, 1. Hey, why are we not seeing 3, 2, 1? Doesn't that seem a little weird? Did I do something wrong here? Shouldn't there be one where, like the second one should be 3, 2, 1, shouldn't it? Let's see. Uh, let's see what I and J are as well as the copy that we're getting. Okay, so swap 0 and 1. Oh, <laughs> okay, I see. I see the issue. It's that I'm modifying A. I'm not modifying copy. That was the whole point that we didn't want to be modifying A. So, okay, there we go. This should be better now. So we should get something like a 2, 1, 3, a 3, 2, 1, and a 1, 3, 2. Perfect. Okay, great, great, great. That's better. That's better than what we had before. Okay, and then basically the idea is we want to say, well, um, if compare, if copy is the same as B, then we're just going to return true because that means it was possible. And at the end, we'll just return false because that means it wasn't possible. So we'll run through that. And what we find is it's passing 9 out of 10. It's passing almost all of these things. Which one is it not passing? Well, the very first one. Why? They were the same to begin with. So, okay, basically one way we could deal with this is we could say, well, before you even get into any of this stuff, just let's say if compare A and B, then return true. No sense in even looping through all this business if they're the same. It's just easier not to. Or we could do it a different way and say something like return compare A and B. So that's basically like after we've gone through all this drama, then we can, instead of returning false, we'll say, oh, well, it's probably false, but just in case they happen to be the same at the beginning and we just wasted a whole bunch of time by doing all these comparisons, let's return this. Okay, so which way is the better way to do it? Uh, this way is not the better way to do it. This, this, yeah, it's not the better way to do it. I'm only doing it this way because it looks a little more slick, but uh, definitely putting in the if at the top is the better way to do it. Uh, okay, so, well, okay. The answer actually would be that it depends, right? Because it depends on how often we're going to have two arrays that are the same. If that's something that only happens like one in a billion times, then putting the if up here might be actually less efficient because that would mean every single iteration of this function, uh, every single time we run the function, it would check to see if they're equal. And, you know, maybe that would be the more useless thing, right? Because if we're running this function a billion times and that's only going to happen once, then Eh, we'd actually waste less time by putting it at the end here. But anyway, the whole point is that we can't really predict what our data is going to look like, so probably it's better to leave it the other way. In fact, now that I'm talking about this, I might as well just do it this way. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's the better way to do it. Okay, great. So, okay, let's, uh, let's submit it, right? I mean, I, I think we're, we're done at this point. Let's go ahead and submit that and... Uh, We'll see if we pass all the hidden tests for this one. I mean, it seems pretty com Oh, no. Okay, so there are a few things to notice. There are three things I want to draw your attention to. The first thing is, check this out. Our score is 29 out of 300. And I think that actually means that that unlocks the next one for us. Does it? Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay. Maybe it used to or something, I thought, or maybe there's a certain threshold score. Uh, but anyway, let's run those tests again so we can see exactly what the console is saying. Oh, sorry, the 
the hidden tests because we want to see exactly what the console was saying and the console I think was saying something about a time limit being exceeded so that's the next thing I want to draw to your attention it's not saying that we got the wrong value or there's a syntax error or something like that it's saying you exceeded the time limit it took too damn long okay why did it take so long so that's where we want to go down here and check this out oh no okay so look at that a dot length huge huge 10 to the power of 5 that's a hundred thousand that's too big that's so big I mean think of all the possibilities we would have for this this is like a big O of n squared algorithm right because we have these nested for loops over here that's too much big O of n squared because if n is a hundred thousand then we're gonna have what 10 billion we'd have 10 billion iterations of the loop here that's too much okay so let's say it was nice knowing you to this one over here and uh, it's too bad it didn't work big O of n squared too damn big and then maybe like a little sad face over there okay great so we've got that one in the archives Oh man, that's disappointing that that didn't work. You know, it seemed like it was a, a pretty cool algorithm. It seemed like it was pretty clear what was going on. Uh, but hey, uh, we're just going to have to move on from here, right? It didn't work. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. So too bad. Better luck next time. Okay, so how are we going to do this then? The problem before is that we we're kind of wasting our time a lot. You know, like we we're wasting our time on stuff that, that just wasn't really relevant. Like switching uh, okay let's take this one for example so like we're doing all kinds of swaps you know we'd swap two and three swap one and three and uh, and then eventually if we hit one that was this then it would stop and say okay yeah it works but we don't want to waste our time with all those ones if we don't have to so maybe there's a way we could go through the arrays and just say like you know iterate through this array once iterate through this array once also and then just say, well, if if there's a mismatch, let's keep track of that. And then we'll sort of analyze the mismatches at the end. So when I say mismatch, basically I mean like, you know, we'll start with i being zero and we'll say, okay, are these ones the same? Yeah, they are. Okay, we'll move on. Are these ones the same? Yeah, they are. Okay, we'll move on. And then if they're not the same, we'll say, oh, that's a mismatch. Let's add that to our array of mismatches and we'll see where we go from there. So let's give that a try. We'll say mismatches is this empty array. And what are we going to do with that empty array? Well, we'll say for let i be assigned the value zero, i is less than a dot length i plus plus. And, you know, you might say, well, hey, weren't you, uh, weren't you using, like, didn't you have a variable for a dot length before? Yeah, I did but uh, I'm not using it twice yet so maybe it's not going to be an issue uh, and then basically I'll say something like if a at i is not equal to uh, b at i then mismatches dot push i you know, I'm basically going to say like uh, that thing at index i let's, let's push it in there uh, or not the thing at index i but the index i itself it's probably just easier to keep track of the index than it would be to keep track of the elements themselves. Okay, so then from there we can sort of analyze what's going to go on. We can see what's going to happen with our mismatches. So we could say, well, first of all, if there are no mismatches, so if the length of this is zero, then we're just going to return true. Uh, we can also say, well, the let's assume that's not the case. So that means that uh, the length is non-zero. Well, what if it's equal to two? Well, that's where things get a little more interesting. So basically, if it's equal to two, then we want to check uh, at those two indices are are the mismatches basically the reverse of each other. So like, okay, let me draw this out for a sec. Let's choose a nice color. I'm thinking kind of like a gold. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move this over here and I'm just going to use this this space right here. Okay, so we had 1, 2, 3 and 2, 1, 3. So 1, 2, 3 and then 2, 1, 3. Right, so here's what I'm trying to say here. Basically, the idea is that we've got two indices where they're mismatched. Let's get kind of like a maybe like a light pink. Yeah. Okay, so they were not the same here and they were not the same here 
they were the same here, so that one was good. Okay, so basically what we're going to say is we've got two indices where these were mismatched. So uh, first we had, we call this index i and index j. Now, basically the idea we can see here is that these are the same and these are also the same. And that's key, you know, if these were not the same, like if this was uh, instead of a 1, 2, if this was like a 5 and a 7 or something like that, there's just no way it could work. Uh, so we need to make sure that these are the same. We know that these are only the these are the only mismatches here, right? Because we're checking this if mismatches dot length is two. So we know there are only two of these. So if it turns out that the first element here or the element from A at index I is the same as the element from B at index J, and the element from A at index J is the same as element B from index I, well then we're good. So let's do that. So first of all, i and j, let's say let i be assigned the value of mismatches at 0, and let j be assigned the value of mismatches at 1. And there's probably another way I could do that. In fact, we'll try that in just a sec. But uh, for now, at this point, all that there's really left to do is to return whether or not well, okay, let me just do this one step at a time. So if a at i is equal to b at j and a at j is equal to b at i, then under that circumstance, we'll return true. And then basically, if it doesn't make it to that, we'll return false. So let's see if that works, first of all. Uh, it, it should be more efficient anyway. If it works, then that's great. Okay, nice. But then there's this thing over here, and I'm saying, well, if this thing is true, then return true. Well, if it's true, then just return that. So return this thing, and that's a little nicer. Just return that Boolean, which happens to be made up of two statements with an and in between them. Okay, nice. Okay, so this is looking really good. There's just one more thing I want to check, and it's the way we're assigning these variables here. I'm wondering if it's possible to do something like this. Let i and j be assigned the value of... Well, okay, we already know that we could do something like this, like, you know, mismatches at 0, mismatches at 1. We've already seen that we can assign variables this way, right? But the thing is, this is, this is the silliest thing. I'm basically saying this is an array that contains the zeroth element of mismatches at index 0 and the first element of mismatches at index 1. I'm talking about mismatches. Like, that's exactly what the array is, because I already know it's length 2 here. So can it work this way? This is what I'm wondering. Oh, look at that. Okay, so that's very nice. I gotta say, I like that. Okay, so that's a cool way to sort of assign these variables. And let's see, is our algorithm working at this point? Oh, yeah, okay, great. So, that feels good. Nice to get that one done. Let's X out of that. I'm kind of inspired by the way we did this over here. In fact, uh, let, me, let me get rid of this one for a sec. And let's reopen this one, because there's one thing I want to try here. This is kind of interesting. Notice... Okay, we, we were doing this temp thing before, right? But now that we know that we can do this, that we can sort of assign variables inside an array like this, could we do something like this? Like copy at i, copy at j is assign the value of copy at j, copy at i. So just swapping them directly, like taking these three lines and replacing it with this. Like, is that possible? Can we do that? Is ES6 that magical? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay, so that's kind of cool. That's really cool, actually. I mean, that's like that whole temp thing we were doing before. Let me get it back on screen. This, this is like such a classic thing. This is something that we're just so used to seeing, something we're so used to ha having been forced to do for so long. So to not have that temp variable in there, that's like liberating. Okay, and let's just scrunch that all together and uh, 
and then forget about this again because it wasn't a very good algorithm. But it's neat that that thing worked that way. Okay, whoops, that's the wrong order. There we go. Okay, so that was too damn big, but it was cool. And then this one, this one worked, worked fine. You know, no, uh, no major issues with it. So, mm, all right, what question do we normally ask ourselves at this point? Is it the best way to do it? Is this the best algorithm? Is there a better way to do it? Well, maybe. Uh, because, you know, we, we often like to sort of see how we can use, uh, like, like array functions, maps, and filters, and stuff like that. So maybe let's try that here. So I have kind of a silly method, but maybe you'll like it. Let's find out. So we're going to say let a diffs. Okay, so basically the the this will be kind of like the not the indices but the elements where a is not the same as b okay so let's just see what elements are different okay and the way we'll do that is we'll say well a dot filter and this filter is going to take in two arguments it's going to take x and i so x is going to be the elements themselves i is going to be the index of those elements and basically i'm just going to say x the element from a is not equal to whatever element B has at the same index as that. Another way I could say this is A at I is not equal to B at I. The reason I'm not saying it that way is because we already have X. It's already the element that's A at I, so no sense in looking up the value in the array if we already know what it is. Okay, so these are basically like, you know, my mistakes from A. It's the, it's the ones at A that didn't match up to the ones at B. And then we're going to do the same thing for B, or at least, you know, the corresponding thing for B. And you might be saying, like, uh, I don't know about using X and I again. Didn't you just use them up here? It's making me a little uncomfortable. But keep in mind, like, these, these are bound to the scope of this function here. You know, like, we can't access X and I outside of this. So it's fine. Don't worry about it. All right, so now we've got our a diffs, we've got our b diffs, and um, what else do we want to do here? Well, uh, hmm. Well, we could say let mismatches, and now mismatches is going to be like actually okay. I'm just going to be super clear about this and say number of mismatches super long variable name but that's fine that's fine that's the cost of being clear to the reader okay and I'll just say that this is going to be a diffs dot length you know because I mean like that that should probably be the same as uh, as as the length of the diffs maybe there are ex some exceptions to that but we'll see so that's our number of mismatches now why are we doing this well okay we want to basically return First of all, the number of mismatches has to be either zero or two. If it's something other than that, then something's wrong. It's it's uh, it's not what we're looking for. So number of mismatches is zero, or number of mismatches is two. Okay. And then anything else? Is that good enough? Well, no, it's not because we also need to make sure that basically the things we have in our a diffs is the same as the things that we have in our B diffs. So let's pop that onto the next line and then uh, okay I'm just gonna do this. So I'm gonna do a diffs dot sort dot join with uh, well, yeah that, that's fine nothing wrong with that the dot B diffs dot sort dot join and put another dot just to be consistent. I mean really we, we could put like whatever character we want over here and it should still work. It's uh I mean I usually use a comma, but nothing wrong with using this. Okay, so wow, that worked. That passed all the all the visible tests anyway. Is it gonna pass all the hidden tests? No way. No way it could. And it does. Wow. Okay. So is this better? I don't know. Let's see. So we're doing we're going through array A, and then we're going through array B, and then 
uh, we're doing this number of mismatches thing, which is just taking the length, we're seeing if it's 0 or 2, and then we're doing, eh, okay, this is the part I don't like so much, the sort.join, but the thing is, um, the thing that's nice about this is, it's only going to get to this point over here if this first part was true. And this is a nice thing about uh, these sort of Boolean operators in JavaScript, is that the only circumstance under which an AND is going to be true is if the first part is true and also the second part is true. So if it turns out that the first part is false, then the JavaScript interpreter isn't going to waste its time checking out this one. It knows the whole thing is false. It has enough information to draw that conclusion as soon as it can see that this thing is false. So basically, that means if it even gets to the point where it's considering this stuff, it must mean that the number in this matches is either 0 or 2. There's no other possible way it could get to this. Uh, so that basically means that our A diffs and most likely our B diffs as well are going to be of length 0 or 2 which means that like you know this sort and join eh, like it, you don't have to worry too much about that it's it's not going to be uh, like the time complexity is not going to be anything more than a constant because the only circumstance under which it'll get here is if it's dealing with an array of length at most two. So it's not like it can continue to scale up, you know, like what I was worried about is sort can get pretty complicated. The time complexity of, of sort I think is at best like an n log n. So that would mean that like if the size of a diffs was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then the amount of time it would take to get this sort done would become longer and longer and longer uh, in, in kind of a bad way and then join also would get longer but only linearly. Anyway, the point is, what I'm trying to say is that we don't need to worry about this really scaling up the time complexity too much uh, and the reason is because it's just going to be an array of most length too. Okay, so that's basically how we would do it if we wanted to use these array functions and stuff like that. Is it the best method? Uh, I think probably not the best, but it's probably not like super the worst or anything. You know, it's probably not like a, a lot worse than what we had before. But the reason I say it's not the best is, well, a few reasons. I, I find this one to be the least clear. I, I don't find it very easy to look at what's going on in this case. Uh, and in fact, it might seem a little magical. So I, I think something like this is just a lot nicer. I think this is getting the point across a lot more clearly. But the thing is, um, this could be better too. And the reason I say that is because in this case, we're starting with an empty array of mismatches, right? Like we, we have no mismatches and then we're filling it up. We're going through the entire array and then filling it up. And then after we've gone through the whole array, that's when we start to work with our mismatches and you know, see if they're uh, if they're matching up the way we want them to, that kind of stuff. So instead, let's just do this a little bit differently. So we're going to go back to this kind of mismatches method. You know, this mismatches strategy. We're going to keep the array here, not just the number of them. But now uh, we're going to loop through a little bit differently because the idea is that we want this to stop as soon as it can, as soon as it has enough information to say either, yep, that's good, or mm, no, nope, that's no good. Okay, so basically the idea is, of course, we're comparing A at I to B at I, and we want to say, well, if those are not the same, that's where we want to start taking some action. So first of all, if we've gotten to this point, and we find that we already have stuff in our mismatches array. And in fact, like, let's say there's so much stuff that it's more than just one thing in there. So that means we've already encountered two mismatches and we're finding a third one now. There's no way we can continue. If there's a third mismatch, don't even bother checking the rest of the array. It's not going to work. So this is basically a nice thing to have because it's going to stop the array. It's going to stop the algorithm as soon as it finds one. Okay, so what if it doesn't? All right, so if it gets past this line right here, that means that our mismatches array must have a length that's either 0 or 1. 
there's only one thing we really need to check at this point. Is it zero? Is our length zero? Well, if it is, then let's just say put that into mismatches. Mismatches.push i. Okay? So if it's zero, if there's nothing in mismatches already, then we'll say, okay, now we have a mismatch. And uh, we'll just put that in there. We know there's one. That's okay. Uh, it'll still execute the next time. But what will it do if it finds another one? Okay, so this else now, I just want to point out, it's an else that's only referring to this if right here. It's not affecting this if at all. Uh, and the reason I'm putting in this, uh, this else is because, or the reason I don't need it to, to correspond to this is because since this was a return, we can already think of everything below it as being like an else, because the only circumstance under which it would hit any of this stuff is if it doesn't trigger this. So this already is kind of like an else because of the return. Uh, okay, so if it makes it to here, it knows already that the length is not greater than 1, so it's either 0 or 1. It also knows that the length is not 0, so it's 1. The only possible way it could make it here is if there is exactly one thing in the mismatches array. So we're going to say let j be assigned the value of mismatches at 0. Okay. Uh, so it's basically just the only element in there. And I have an idea of how we might do that differently, but let's just do this first. So this is kind of like what we had before. We're saying, well, actually in some ways I think it's kind of the opposite of what we had before because we're saying, well, if either of these don't match, so if a at i is not b at j, or if a at j is not b at i, well then we really shouldn't be returning true. So under this circumstance we're also going to return false. And then uh, just in case it, it makes it past that and it doesn't return false, we're going to do a mismatches.push of i. And the reason we're doing this is so that the next time it runs through, let's say it made it through here, no problem, the next time it runs through, now it'll say, well, if it finds another mismatch, Ooh, you got one too many there, pal. Gonna we'll have to return a false on that one. Okay, so is this good enough? Well, let's see. If it makes it to the end of that, I guess we'll return true in that circumstance. And we'll return false basically as soon as we can. We do need to go through the whole array before we return true because um, otherwise we don't know if there's another mismatch coming up later. So. Let's see if that runs. Yes, that runs. And this is probably the most efficient algorithm that we've come up with so far. Anyway, Now that thing I was thinking of before is this. Mismatches at zero. We know if it's getting to here that there's only one thing in mismatches. We know that it's an array containing only one thing. So I'm wondering, can I do a spread operator? You know, like mismatches at zero is basically the whole thing. It's the whole array, but without the brackets. On, uh, on the left and right of it. So could I just do that? Like, is, is that possible? Eh, no, it's not. Okay, well, we tried. So I guess the spread operator doesn't always just dissolve the uh, square brackets. That's good to know. I'm glad we checked. And there we go. And, and by the way, there's, there's a bit of a meta lesson there. And it's that, you know, like we just encountered something that I wasn't familiar with, right? Like, uh, like I'm a learner just like you guys, right? So I don't claim to know all of this stuff yet. I had an idea. Would this work? The best way to tell is test it. You know, like we could have looked that up and we could go and do a Google search now, like why didn't that work? But the main, main thing to take away from this is if you've got an idea, test it out. You know, test lots of stuff out. Like you, you gotta, this is your playground, you know, you gotta play around with this stuff. You've got to, um, Get the practice, get the muscle memory, understand the tools you're working with. So, you know, get your hands dirty. Actually actually do the stuff. That's what I recommend. Anyway, uh, let's, let's, well, okay, so, Mike, you're talking about putting mismatches in uh, a new array where we're spreading it out. The problem with that is it's still an array. We don't want this to be an array. We want J to just be the single number that's in the array right now. So yeah, I see what you're saying. Like we can make an array and then spread it. And in fact, that's um that's something we could have done down here. So let's let's go back to the first algorithm we were using. And is this one that didn't work? Yeah, this one didn't work. But uh, here, when we're doing a deep copy of a dot slice, that's where we can do something like that. You know, we could say we want a new array, and it's going to contain the elements from a. So that's the same as a dot slice. This is going to work just as well as it did before. The problem is, 
it's not any better than it did before so it's still not going to pass all the hidden tests so we're going to forget about that one and we're going to keep this one in mind this is our our darling algorithm it's the one that worked fastest out of all the ones we looked at so far so is there a faster way to do it well hey look i i'd be reckless if i said no there definitely isn't there may very well be i mean people come up with brilliant algorithms all the time so yeah there might be a way to do this but is it one that I personally understand myself or currently possess in my knowledge? Uh, no. As far as I know, this is probably the best way to do it, but who knows? There's, there's probably a better way. I mean, if we got a machine learner in here, I'm sure it'd come up with something a lot more brilliant than this. All right, so did we submit this? I can't remember, but we'll submit it now just in case. So 7651 is the official JS the Game solution to the R similar task. Alright, no, nice job everyone. 